I am your host, Gary Baumgarten. I welcome you to the show, and I encourage you to go early and often, just like voting in Chicago, to ReporterGary.com. ReporterGary.com, that is the website for the Pal Talk News Network, where you will see stories that you may or may not see, hear, or read in the mainstream media. I want to take this away for the first portion of the show from the political aspects that so many people have been focusing on and take a look at mental health care in the United States. I think we can all agree that uh, Mr. Lofton is probably, even though none of us, or at least I'm not a mental health professional, probably mentally ill, deranged, sick, loony kazuni, whatever term you want to place on it. A U.S. Marshal today said in an interview that uh, Lofton is just kind of smiling and staring out into space, acting very, very weird in his jail cell. We may never know what really is going on in the mind of the young man, but it's clear from all of the indicators that we have received that his actions... Uh, were disturbing to people around him and not in retrospect we always hear this kind of stuff in retrospect people who never commented uh, prior to an incident such as this say in retrospect oh yeah I always thought he might go off his nut and do this there are people on the record including former classmates who wrote emails concerned that he might come to his community college class with a loaded gun and start popping off people and his instructor in his class also fearful that this individual was a danger to himself and others so obviously there were precursors and yet seemingly nothing or not enough was done to try to intervene and help him or at least isolate him so that he wouldn't be a danger to himself or others, as he clearly showed uh, he was on Saturday in Tucson. Well, joining us to kind of put this in perspective and help us wade our way through this today is Kim Lifton. Kim Lifton is a journalist and author and a mental health advocate. Uh, she gained an interest in mental health issues after a tragedy struck her own family because she had a, a sister who was uh, beset with uh, unfortunately uh, mental health problems and she has been attuned to this issue and active and is actually writing a book about it and so uh, I have asked her and she has adjusted her schedule because I know right now she's supposed to be taking her daughter to dance class, but instead she's joining us on News Talk Online on the Pal Talk News Network. Uh, Kim, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Gary. Well, thank you. Uh, t t tell us very briefly uh, what happened tragically in your family that caused for you to uh, become aware and active when it came to mental health issues. I'll try to do it with as with few emotions as possible here. I had um, a twin sister who was diagnosed with bipolar disorder when we were in college, and she pretty much was untreated. She would refuse to take medication. It, it was not a great situation, and our family and my parents and people who loved her, we did everything we could within our own powers to help her and there was nothing we could do. She ended up walking across the street and getting hit by a car. Um, I'm assuming though that you wanted me to share my own fears of having uh, of what could have happened in addition to that, right? Right, well you had some of the same kinds of premonitions about your sister as pe people had expressed yeah. with regard to, to Gerald uh, Lawson. I, um, I thought that Things were going badly for my sister, and I had fears. I had great fears that she was the most calmest, sweetest person in the world when she was herself. But when 
she was in her manic state. My sister became someone none of us recognized. She became a person who was paranoid. She had a great fear that the government was spying on her and that people were out there to hurt her, to hurt me, to hurt our friends, to hurt our family. And I had this terrible fear that other people would get hurt besides my sister. And when I heard about this recent tragedy in Arizona and I started hearing about people blaming the families, it broke my heart because we don't know what went in on that household. We don't know what the parents tried to do to help their son. And I've been reading posts on Facebook, friends, people who know stuff about mental illness, blaming the family for what the son did. And I just can't do that. I feel so much compassion toward them. Um, I'm absolutely certain that they're grieving as much as the families of the people who, bury, who are going to bury their, pe their fit loved ones. So I thought I would share this with people so that maybe others could have some compassion toward the family as well. And they have asked the news media to please leave them alone. And I think, you know, as a reporter, I would agree. You know, you shouldn't hound folks sometimes in situations like this, as in the case of the parents of the nine-year-old girl who were killed, uh, people find it cathargic to uh, speak to reporters. But quite often, especially when they're all camped out in large numbers with their live trucks uh, and their generators running and taking over a neighborhood, uh, they feel, geez, I don't understand why, but somehow they feel intimidated by all of that. And um, I could understand why they just don't want to deal with reporters at this time. Yeah, and it's not just reporters. It's, and people are curious. They want to know what he was like at home. They want to know so much stuff. And I'm sure, I'm sure that there was a point when he might have been seemingly a normal little boy. And certainly the parents knew something wasn't right, but they probably... I mean, even if they did have some inclination, how do we know they didn't try to stop it? How do we know? Remember, at Columbine, um, people were harassing the families of the of the two kids who shot up the school and and calling them terrible parents. And all of a sudden, you know, your life's work as a parent is to be a good parent to your children. No matter who you are, you always do the best you can. And I just, I want to believe that these parents did the best they could, just like my own parents did the best they could. We all try and, to... And, and the thing is, Kim, Kim Lifton, I, I'm sorry, Kim, I thought you... Sure. Uh, I, I'm sorry, there's a little bit of a lag here, I guess, and I uh, and I jumped over you, and I didn't mean to do that, and I apologize. Well, okay. uh, I, I just wanted to say, uh, once a person reaches the age of majority, age of reason, 18 years of age, uh, you can't force them. I don't think you could force them even before they are 18 to take their medication. So even you can't make a person seek treatment for a mental health illness. And if they do seek treatment, you can't make them take their medication. You can implore them to, uh, but you can't right. force them to take it. And our society is so flawed. Um, if you can, I mean, you can still make or act somebody using that as a phrase. You can still, if you've been in Michigan, if you've been near a person of concern for two weeks or more, you can commit somebody. But within two days, that person will be out and back on the street, and there's not a whole lot you can do to medicate a person in two days. So the system and, is and, and the thing is, once they're released, once they're released, even if there's follow-up, um, you know, you can't ensure that they're going to, you know, if in a situation like that, that's kind of triaging them. You, you put them into a crisis center. It's not a full psychiatric center where uh, the individual is going to get long-term treatment and you try in, in those two days uh, to, to stabilize the person. And oftentimes, outside of their normal environment and whatever it is in that environment that is uh, triggering their activities, uh, they do calm down, and and uh, I know they do things like individual therapy and they do group therapy. But then ultimately, they have to let that person go. And when they do, and as in the case of Michigan, where you are in two days, uh, there's no way for those uh, healthcare mental health care professionals to ensure that the individual will follow up on their recommendations 
no matter what they might promise at the time they're in the crisis center, to seek full counseling for for their problem. Well, it's, true. it's true, and I'm not sure if it's two days or three days, but I know that it's similar throughout the country, and Arizona has one of the worst, worst states for mental health care. Um, it's just, I really, truly believe that research is the answer. Um, I think, you know, politics aside, I think we need to invest more federal dollars into research for mental health. I know the University of Michigan is working with three other major universities in the country to do research on mental health. There's um, the Proctor Bipolar Research Fund is doing phenomenal, phenomenal research on the genetics of bipolar disorder. Um, there's a lot of good stuff happening, but not, but not enough. I don't know if that makes sense. And we really need, I think we need to use what happened in Tucson to really educate America, the world, on mental health, the problems with the lack of care, and educate people so that they're aware and teach everybody how to recognize the signs and symptoms, know what to do, to know when to seek help, and to know where to get it. We have, we have a flawed system. That's why this stuff uh, There's been a lot of speculation, and I'm not going to ask you to speculate any further than uh, other people who know uh, nothing about Jared Lofton, just like you and I know nothing other than what we have read in the papers and heard on television about him. But I want to take you back to your sister and her belief that uh, the government was out to get her. Is it was it your experience that sometimes uh, events that were publicly reported upon triggered that in her? Or was that something that just happened uh, and there se seemingly there was no cause and effect that created it? I'm not an expert on this. I'm just, you know, I'm just a regular person who cares, but I, I believe most of the people I know, most of the people have been affected. It's just something that happens. There's no cause. There are triggers. And I think in the case of my sister, there may have been triggers, but I'm not sure what they were. Um, she just got, when you become delusional, you, you get paranoid. And, you, and you, you look over your back. You think people are just spying on you. So it makes sense that, the, you know, to me it was all weird. I didn't understand it. But she thought the government was spying on her. She thought movie studios were, were spying on her. She saw little people in the refrigerator. I, I just think it's part of the illness. And it's, it's psychosis. It doesn't matter if it's schizophrenia, bipolar. There's so many different illnesses. But psychosis is psychosis. And when you're in that state, you can do things like, like, that are violent. Anybody could. The guest is Kim Lifton, L-I-F-T-O-N. She is a reporter and a, an author and a mental health activist. We asked her to come on today to talk uh, in the wake of the Tucson shooting from her perspective uh, about the issue of mental health care in the United States. And as she has said, uh, the, uh, the mental health care facilities vary from state to state, and Arizona doesn't have a particularly good reputation when it comes to this issue. We're not suggesting here that the that the state we don't even know whether he had come to the attention of the mental health uh, community in Arizona. We don't know what was or what was not done for him, but we do know that the reputation there is that it's not particularly good as compared to some other states. Kim Lifton, thank you for sharing your very personal story. Uh, we'd love to have you back to to uh, discuss a little bit more. Uh, what you're seeing, and uh, and maybe the the next time we have you on, we'll have a little bit more time to uh, to delve into some of the possible solutions to this uh, problem of a shortage of mental health care in the United States. Okay, thank you for having me, Gary. <laughs> okay, I ran over. It's time for the aftermath. See you tomorrow. Peace out. <laughs>